very warm welcome to today's webinar. Hope you're feeling great and looking forward to the next hour, which we promise is going to be inspiring and motivating and all the things we hopefully always bring you. So today in partnership with our friends, um, Landor, um, we are bringing to you a webinar all about brand resilience. Um, Landor, if you don't know them, they're a fantastic um, agency, a real global leader in branding consultancy and design, and they work, work with their clients to lead growth. And we've worked with them over the years and we love our partnership and always the events that we do together are really popular um, and I know today is as well which is really cool. So many of us have been pivoting and reframing and working out how to um, take the opportunities out of this time. So today we're really going to focus on how brands can reinvent themselves and look at the opportunity particularly in difficult and challenging times like today which is really exciting. So we've got a three part webinar, if you like. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from our speaker. He's going to share for about 15 or so minutes um, his thoughts. Um, I'm then going to jump on to have a conversation, which at that time, as always, you all get to ask lots and lots of questions um, to your heart's content and we'll bring as many in as possible. Please, as I always say, use the Q&A function um, because that will allow us to um, that will allow us to pinpoint the questions and the chat gets quite busy. But I just want to um, try the chat right now. So, and I can see lots of people are joining as we speak. Um, so just to try the chat, um, just say where you're zooming in from and how you're feeling today in one word, as we always do, it, it works quite well. So hopefully we're going to start to see some people sharing where they're coming in from. I know there's lots of you on because I can see the numbers. So unless my chat isn't working, it doesn't seem to be coming on yet. Okay, in, in London, thank you, Nick. We've got feeling good. Woking, optimistic in Edinburgh, always Graham, excited, feeling good, wonderful. Coming in from Dubai, is it sunny in Dubai? Feeling very hot, yeah, not expect that. Oxford and inspired. Oh, that's my friend Crawford. Hello, lovely. Um, brilliant. So we've got some real friendly faces and I know we've got some new faces joining us today as well, which we're um, really excited about. And I think, ah, yeah, I, I thought our um, incoming chief exec was on there, but I'm not actually sure if I did see her name because it's going up so quickly, but I know she likes to join us lots and she's going to be joining us loads in uh, the very, very near future. Um, we're also trying something different today um, in that lots of you've been saying, so at the end of our polls, at the end of our webinars, we've been putting a poll and asking what you're looking for. So we've been making sure we're responding to the subjects, but also people are keen to have opportunities to connect. And um, as we always do at our events, have that brilliant time um, to meet each other and get to know each other. So for the end 15 minutes of today, um, we'd love you all to stay on um, and we will make you all co-hosts because that's the whizzy technology we have. Um, so you all come up on screen, we'll get to see you all and we can have a bit of a chat and also if anyone has further questions for our brilliant speaker um, that's the time to ask them as well and we can just have a little bit of a chin wag as we do at our usual events if people want to bring wine to the occasion they're incredibly welcome I'm teetotal today so I won't uh, be joining you which is quite odd for me um, so back to today um, we've got a really incredible speaker and I spoke to him at length yesterday and he um, he just blows my mind with um, the way he speaks um, we're lucky very lucky to be joined by Thomas Ordell um, Chief Strategy Officer of Landor. Um, Thomas's role is to manage global strategy, practice and lead projects for key clients. He's had a very glittering career and um, been at Siegel & Gale, um, where our, um, one of our brilliant chairs in New York um, is based, Margaret Malloy, and he's held sen senior roles at different global brand consultancies, including having his own business as well, which I'm really keen to talk to him about. Um, he is a regular writer and commentator um, frequently on the challenges facing today's brands and he's been featured in lots of different places as well as the Marketing Society most importantly um, but also the New York Times, the Financial Times and NBC's Today Show. So without further ado Thomas come and join us and I will see you afterwards for the questions. Welcome, thank you. Thanks Gemma. Hi, hi everyone, good afternoon in London, good morning in New York. I'm based in New York. It's a beautiful day, so my one word is, I think, is feeling happy. The birds are singing, the sun is shining. Um, I mean, th these words are almost don't, don't deserve to be spoken. We hear them so often, but we're all in uncharted waters, uncertain times, unexpected challenges. And the topic for today is to think about what's, 
what's the role of brand? How do we, how do we ensure brand resilience? Um, what is the role of brand in challenging times? What are we seeing working? And I'm just going to share some thoughts. I'm not going to do slides, which is sort of radical for a strategist. It's kind of like Bugs Bunny without his carrot. But uh, I'm going to, you know, it's, it's, these are different times. And I think it's, it's good to experiment and try things. So um, I'm going to chat about some observations that I'm seeing and some, some uh, best practices. But before that, I want to open with a poll. I know we have a polling capability. Um, and I think that's going to pop up on its own. Yep, there it is. I'm assuming we'll see the results momentarily. Aha, yes. Well, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a friendly audience. 78% more relevant, 9% uh, less relevant, and 13% the same. So thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in good company then on the, the talking points for today. You know, I think that's what's been really interesting to me in, uh, in this time. I mean, I, to be honest, I would have if you'd asked me, you know, pre-crisis, pre-COVID and all that, you know, the role of purpose, I might have thought, well, maybe it's a bit metaphysical, you know, maybe it's a bit abstract, a bit soul-searching, you know, we're, you know, would we really be thinking about purpose in the, in the context of a very short-term challenging environment? And this is really, for me, the kind of insight that's, that's really been most pronounced over the last few months is that suddenly purpose is actually more useful than ever. It's actually, it's actually become very practical. I don't think we always use the word practical with purpose. Purpose is often a sort of metaphysical soul searching, you know, who am I, you know, contemplative. But in the situation that we're in right now, where things are unexpected, difficult to plan for, we need to respond very quickly to unforeseen scenarios, what's our reference point? You know, how do we make decisions? You know, I was on a call just the other day with a, with a friend and a client who was wrestling with responding to some of the events in, in North America right now that we're, that we're going through. And, you know, she's like, wow, you know, it'd be very easy just to put some platitudes up there and sort of say nice things. But, you know, what do we really stand for? What do we really have to say here? And so I am find that people are turning to purpose as a tool, as a guide, as a framework in a very practical, immediate and urgent sense. And I think that's something for me personally has been kind of a new, a new experience, a new, a new observation in my long career in the branding business. This is something I hadn't really expected. And so I think that's been quite interesting to see is the sort of purpose becomes practical, you know, and it isn't something we often use. I even was thinking of the, the, the poetic metaphor for purpose is North Star. Suddenly that became very real to me. I thought, well, what does that mean? Well, it means if you're at sea, and if you're using it as a navigation, which I think is where the reference comes from, you know, you're at sea, you look up and you find the North Star, right? Well, I think a lot of us have been feeling at sea uh, and not quite sure where we are and turning to that. So I think that's been very interesting. So I just want to talk about a few ways I'm seeing people use purpose to guide decisions. The first is, and I think this is a very simple but often elusive idea, do what you do best. You know, I think everyone has been feeling this need to respond, to take action, to, you know, how can we, you know, make the world better? How can we contribute socially? How can we um, you know, in terms of our, you know, either it's, you know, you know corporate uh, social responsibility or whether it's, you know, with our employees. And I think what's interesting is you're seeing the most successful brands just focus on what they do best. You know, one example I love is OpenTable is the reservation uh, platform. And I think it's global, I know in the U.S., but for restaurants and, you know, obviously restaurants are all shut down. So what do we do now? You know, how do we, how do we respond to this? And they started doing uh, reservations for spots at uh, grocery stores. So if they want to do social distancing and sort of do kind of crowd management, they turn the platform into a way to, to manage that uh, for grocery stores. You know, another one out of London I thought was really interesting was Time Out is now done a kind of short-term rebrand as Time In, you know, and again, kind of repurposing, you know, what their 
value creation is, which is around enabling people to enjoy and explore the city, but doing it through a, you know, inside of doors, where, you know, mech, you know uh, approach as opposed to, um, you know, giving you guides to outside activities. You know, Hiltman Amex donating a million rooms to healthcare workers. Uh, Dyson was one of the first businesses to come out and say, we're going to help figure out how to make a ventilator very quickly and then act on it. All of those things, I think what's interesting is they're all core to what that business does and how they create value. And that was a very clear reference to purpose. So the first thing I'm saying is just do what you do best when in question. I think a purpose is a guide to that. The second is what we're calling cultivate your community. And one of the things I'm personally very interested in with brand and how it's evolving, evolving is brands are becoming a, a forum to organize communities of interest and shared values and share, you know, uh, you know, culture and, you know, brands have expanded beyond just a kind of commercial promise. You know, they're becoming a mechanism to organize communities of interest in people. And I think a lot of the strongest brands out there are able to cultivate and sustain those communities over time and, uh, and to, to uh, help build their brands. One example, we work with Alvin Ailey, which is a dance studio in, in, uh, in the U.S., in New York. And, you know, obviously that's a very physical, you know, experience, right? Dance, you know, it's to go and observe it or to be a student or whatever you're doing is physical. And they've launched their own virtual platform to do dance lessons, to do online classes, to do online performances. They're showing historic performances. So I was really, I, I admired their ability to pivot and take the core of who they are and sustain the community they have, even in a, in a, in a virtual world. Another example, this was a bit of a weird one, but I just love it because I was there. So a few months ago, or I guess almost nine months ago, uh, I went to the Faroe Islands, which is, you know, is quite north and sort of between Norway and Iceland. Um, and obviously it's hard to get to in the best of times and in, in COVID times, it's impossible. But they need to cultivate that community of interest, people that want to go there. And so they have this kind of remote touring via locals where you can, you can log in and the local will give you a tour virtually of the Faroe. So it was a way for them to kind of leverage the distance but then keep people engaged in the place which i thought was really that really smart you know this the next idea is this notion of change and being prepared to change and i think you know lots are being lots is being written about you know the world will never be the same again you know we could probably argue to what extent to which that's going to be true but i do think we will all change and not just because we have to but because we've learned something in this time we can now use going forward in a different way you know um, an example I thought was interesting was the Finnish uh, Hockey League uh, did their playoffs using esports. Now, we know esports is now really growing massively uh, around the world. And I thought it was an interesting kind of combination of the physical sports with esports. And I could see that becoming a trend. You know, you could see esports becoming more integrated into, um, into traditional physical sports, you know. And so this was a place for them to try something different. I mean, they were sort of being forced to experiment. That experiment might endure you know, even in a post COVID world. Another example from the UK was, you know, people were very upset not getting their Heinz products uh, in the UK, and they um, created a, a, a direct-to-consumer offer where you can get Heinz at home, but they were able to deliver Heinz directly to, um, to people's homes who couldn't go to the store as conveniently. And so, again, a direct-to-consumer model probably wasn't on their, in their plan before, but it is now. So will that, you know, will that be a permanent part of their future? So, again, really interesting to see how people are experimenting out of necessity, but from that, I think we'll retain things um, into the future. And then, you know, this, this other notion is practice the possible. And I think this is something I think we've all um, thought about a lot, right? I mean, really you think about, okay, what are we gonna do? You know, we think about it at Landor, how do we work with our clients? You know, we're doing, you know, we've started projects in the COVID space where we haven't even met anybody ever once in person. And we're doing virtual collaborations and we're doing brainstorms and whiteboarding sessions and all this, and we're all, experimenting and grappling with it together and it's actually working for the most part quite well and i think this is about learning to practice the possible you know do what you can do in the situation you're in and i think again purpose is a guide to helping you make those decisions you know we're hearing about you know i know another, another uk example the honest burgers you know people can't come and do it they can't come and, and buy one in the store or the, or the restaurant so they're shipping you know DIY, diy burger kits you know there's uh, bakeries I've been hearing by the West Coast in the United States that are doing there's been a kind of everyone's stuck at home and gaining tons of weight and baking a lot they've been shipping out you know home baking kits you know so um, it's interesting to see how businesses are quickly adapting to the uh, possibilities of the moment again very instructive and again guided by the North Star that is our purpose so 
I'm going to summarize now. I think I've hit the hit, hit the time mark. Um, purpose is practical. I think that to me, if someone said, what's the thing you really pulled out of this experience is suddenly the practicality of purpose as opposed to a deep soul searching thing, which it is, and that's good, but it's also a very useful tool to guiding business decisions. And the four things that I'm seeing really successful businesses do is one, do what you do best, two, cultivate your community, three, be prepared to change, and four, practice the possible. So Gemma, that is my prepared remarks. And then we're gonna do some questions. We certainly are. That was that was quick. I was listening avidly, and I'm, when you said you're nearly finished, I was like, "What?" I um, am. I'm, I'm, I'm obedient to the clock. It said nine fifteen here, so I thought well, I better, you know, better stay yeah. on schedule. You never need to be obedient with the marketing society. Our, our members will uh, will tell you that. Um, lovely. So, guys, this is a time when you can ask questions. Um, if you can use the Q and A function, that would be awesome. Um, but it'd be really good to hear. Um, what you think and um and and have an opportunity to talk to thomas as well so you, you mentioned I, I love what you said about purpose um do you think it's being used differently now as we're in covid times do you think some things have changed yeah yeah, I just, yeah. It, yeah no I, it's, it's, it's it's me just to me it's so fascinating because you know i miss a lot of my work a lot of the work i do is pr around purpose um and it's all been great. It's, it's very interesting conversations, but often it is at this very high level, this very kind of 30,000 foot, you know, how do we create social value and soul searching and kind of a metaphysical exercise sometimes. And what, what's interesting is to suddenly see how people are using their purpose in a very practical, immediate way. And that it's usefulness. It's not just useful as this sort of metaphysical abstraction or this kind of deep, you know, who are we and how do we create value sort of stuff. It's also then comes to earth very quickly and helps guide immediate decisions. And so that utility, I think, has been, has been a new dimension of purpose or a new dimension of how being, purpose is being used um, in a crisis situation has been really interesting. I think for me, at least, maybe others, you know, a kind of emerging development from this time. And have you, you, you mentioned some of the examples, but is there any examples that you have um, where you've seen the brands that are beginning to reinvent themselves in a, in a brilliant way? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think the examples I mentioned, I mean, there's others that, I mean, there was one I saw, I think it's Cruise America was the RV company. You know, they, they, I mean, the RV business, which, you know, if you read historically, I think was having some challenges with demographics and boomers and different age groups and things. And suddenly now, they're supplying like virtual you know, office space and, you know, um, you know, people want to build, you know, put an office next to their house or they need it for government employees. And so the whole notion of a mobile space is now totally different in this context, right? So they're pivoting to kind of address that market very quickly. Yeah, so I mean, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's so many different examples, but I mean, it's interesting to see how businesses are evolving and changing very quickly in the conditions. Yeah, there's a, there's a good question come up which which relates to this, but I please ask you to use the Q and A function, not the chat function. Um, but I will ask it anyway, um, George. So, um, how how do you think brands differentiate themselves in the middle of such viral moments? So, not to give the impression of piggybacking on COVID, because we've heard quite a lot about that and, and other cliches. So, how do you think yeah. they they can differentiate themselves? And and do you think you can be authentic and articulate your purpose? without adding to the hype of each viral moment. Pun intended. Quite a long question. So two things did, yes, you, use the chat function and also made it too long. So use the Q&A function and make it shorter. That would be amazing going forward. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think that goes back to the first point I was making, which is do what you do best. You know, I think a lot of people in the very beginning thought we have to do some kind of heroic gesture. You know, we need to, I mean, but there was one early on I thought was so kind of clever where U-Haul, the uh, moving company in the US, and I went through this, I've got two kids in college, so I went through this very experience. They had been on holiday with me, they were with a holiday with me, and um, they suddenly, their dorms shut down. So how do they get their stuff? Where do they put their stuff? Blah, 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 and you all, I think they offered free storage for college students for a period of time to help them kind of this short-term need. It's a fairly humble thing. I mean, they're not saving the world, they're not solving, you know, world peace here. But they did what they did best, and they addressed a real authentic need. And to me, that's the kind of thing that resonates, as opposed to the sort of grand, you know, soaring, you know, I mean, you know, unless you are a grand and soaring brand, which there are some of, but I think the brands that have done the best are the ones that really um, 
took what they do, the core value they create, and they applied it in the context in a relevant yeah. way. Yeah, lovely. We've got lots of questions coming up, which I love. Um, brands in hospitality that are well established in the region and their purpose to cater to the elite class, how do you think they can cultivate the community as a whole? So I guess that comes back to your community point mm -hmm. earlier. I missed the part you said something about class. I didn't hear that part. Sorry. Um, brands in hospitality that are well established in a region and their purpose is to cater to the elite class. How do you think they can cultivate the community as a whole? Interesting question. I guess it comes back to your community point um, that you were making earlier. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think, I mean, that we could, that we could have a long debate about that question. I mean, I, I don't know that I agree with the question implicitly that it's about a class. That, that, yeah, that's, that's why you couldn't hear me say it because I was slightly, <laughs> when I said I mean, it. I mean, I think that there are people that are luxury hotel consumers. I have plenty of rich friends that are really frugal and never would stay in a five-star hotel. And I have friends that, you know, scrape and save for two years, they can go spend three days at the Four Seasons. So I think it's about people that are interested in that experience. Yeah. And that are, uh, and they, that is a community of interest, people that like luxury. I have friends that love luxury hotels and they review them and they blog about them and they get excited. And again, I have friends that are super cheap and they, you know, you know, they, their motto is that they're all the same with the lights off. So, you know, I, I think it's about, again, I think it's about, I think it's less about class and more about what interests you and where do you yeah. want to spend your money? Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's fair and that was a, that was a good answer. Um, have you seen examples, this is from Nick, and I know Nick's in, in London because I saw him earlier. Um, have you seen examples where um, clients are using COVID to accelerate for their search for purpose? And any examples where you think clients have shied away from looking for a purpose? Great question. Uh, it's really good first question. answer is yes. I mean, but I think here, here's, what I'm, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying one of three things. One is we don't have a purpose. Oh my God, oh no. You know, a bit like the example I used before about the person who's trying to respond to the George Floyd stuff and like, what do we even say? I mean, other than just, you know, nice things, you know. Two, people that, that are, that, that this is stress testing their purpose. And they're like, wow, our purpose isn't actually standing up to, or not doing the, you know, working as hard as it should in these situations. And then three, there are people that have a clear purpose and are really able to use it effectively. And so, and I'm working with companies across all three of those situations. Um, but I do think everyone that I, that I, work with is seeing the need for it and then they're seeing the value of it in a very immediate and real sense yeah yeah no thank you um i suppose building on um what you just said about recent global events um we've got an, a question here from our editor um mike um but given that the recent global events um and the last few years building up to this point what extent do you think purpose and activism go hand in hand um, he's used an example of Ben and Jerry's dismantled white supremacy. These questions are big, guys. My goodness. Yeah. Um, I yeah. <laughs> Bring it on. I mean, look, I think it depends on, and that's it, such a, it's such a, it, there's so many nuances to the question. I mean, I think it, um, I think part of it goes back to the community idea that you, that if you, you know, like REI, I mean, there's lots of brands that take very strong positions that reinforce their community. Now, that can go different ways. You know, another more controversially, Chick-fil-A, you know, has taken some very controversial or its founder did or has some controversial practices, but in a way it's also, that's its core market. So partly the businesses that struggle the most with it, I think, with taking these sort of social positions are the ones that are addressing everybody, you know, versus if you have a very targeted constituency that you can sort of double down on that. Um, but another dimension of it, which is really interesting, I was in a meeting once with, you know, about two years ago with a, I won't name the brand, but a Fortune 20 company CEO. We were having a kind of casual conversation and he said, you know, what's interesting is how much, at least in the US, of the social agenda is being advanced by corporate America. You think like domestic partner benefits, um, you know, recognizing, um, you know, uh, gay couples, all that. That was way before the US government ever did that. So it's interesting to see that actually there's quite a bit of social advancement is being carried by a lot of large corporations and large brands, um, and they lead a lot of governmental organizations. So I don't know if that's answering the question, maybe I'm rambling a bit, but I think it is interesting how much businesses are advancing the social agenda and taking a leadership role in that. Yeah, no, I agree. We've seen some, some great examples of it. Um, 
do you think brands in the future will change their ability to collaborate with each other? And if so, how? We've talked about this a lot on our, our webinar program. Absolutely. I mean, I think that is such a big part of the future of brand development and brand building and not just like co-branding. It's not just logo slapping where we're going to like, you know, let's, you know, share logos on things. I mean, it's going to really be co-development and it's going to be, um, um, actually, you know, creating new products together. It's going to be addressing new markets together, particularly when they share communities. This is where I'm so obsessed with, and it's my personal sort of obsession is brand as a brand as a, where my motto is don't build a brand, build a community. You know, the community is, that's the organizing principle. And communities are markets. They're sources of insights. They're loyalists. They're you know, sources of innovation. And so I think as brands all orbit similar communities, they will leverage those together to address the needs of those communities. And how do you think, just, just building on that, um, I love that, um, don't build a brand, build a community. And given that we're a global community, um, I, I, I resonate with that hugely. How do you, what advice would you give to brands to be able to do that, to start thinking like um a community um and, and start changing yeah mindset. yeah i have a whole i have a yeah i mean it, you know, i think one it, what's interesting is it is about purpose because it does attract you know people are you know people are attracted to an assertion right of belief you know you stand for something and that's what i think often attracts communities right you have shared values shared interests so the first is to be very clear about that right and what that is and then you attract it but then you have to invite participation and this is where for brand people, brand managers, brand agencies, you know, the idea of allowing people in to help inform and shape and influence that community, that's, new, that, that's a new muscle group for most of us, right? How do we, rather than just making something and pushing it out to the world and hoping they buy it, we're actually bringing them in. And there's a lot of interesting brands out there that are doing that, that are engaging a wider audience and it's informing their product development and their marketing and all that. Love that. That's brilliant. The questions are coming thick and fast. I'm just trying to ensure we're asking lots of different ones. Um, this is a good one from Erica. Um, would you advise to not launch a new brand at this current time um, if messaging is not related to the current situation? Should we wait? So I guess people are looking for advice. What would you say, um, particularly if budget is limited? Yeah, I, you know, it's a great question, and I don't have a totally 100% clear answer. I could, we've been sort of, it's interesting. So, for example, there's been a lot of assumptions at the beginning of COVID that you shouldn't do market research because people will, one, be distracted, and two, um, it's distorted. And we're actually finding the opposite, that it's actually a great time to do market research. People are very interested, they're engaged. Um, and I think that, my, that, that observation could relate to launching a new product, where in some ways people are, are hungry for something new. Um, I mean, I think it obviously depends on the product. I think people are open to things that are new. They're interested in things that are new. Um, so, I, you know, I wouldn't take it as a matter of, of, a, of a kind of knee-jerk assumption to not launch now. I think it could actually be a great time to launch. Yeah, no, I agree. Again, so, it depends on the product. I mean, it's, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and I love what you said about community as well. What do, what do you think um, brand leaders can be doing right now to prepare for a post-COVID world stroke, the new, new, new normal? whatever that might be, what advice would you give? You know, there's lots of different dimensions to that. I mean, I think one is to look at your purpose, which I'll keep hammering that point. I think the other is um, to look at what, I mean, there's the old motto and it's being overused right now, but it's always true is don't waste a good crisis. And it's a good time to clean out old practices. It's a good time to really question I, mean, I know Mark Reed, who's the you know CEO of WPP, which owns Landor, and he you know, he's had a quote recently in a, a talk he was giving about how you know two years of innovation has been condensed into three months, and you know a lot of ways this is a great time to really take a hard look at your brand, at your business, um, how you're engaging your customers. You know, another friend was mentioning the other day about you know the notion of while you were away for businesses that are physical, you know, like retail and restaurants and all that. I wonder, I think we'll all go back kind of expecting it to be a little different. Will it all be the same? I don't know if we want it to be all the same. Yeah. So I think it's a moment to, to, to inquire. I think it's a moment to reflect on what, you know, how can you use this moment in time to drive change you've always wanted to? Love that. And would you say that's the biggest opportunity that you see coming out, out of this? Yeah, and, then, and to innovate and create new value in a ways that, you know, in, in a time that's different. I think that is the, uh, that. And also I think, I didn't, there's another dimension, of course, which is that I think the brands that are really showing up now are, are, are building loyalty. And I think the ones that are really delivering in a valuable way are 
deepening relationships. So I would say it's deepening relationships and looking for ways to innovate in the context of this time. I love that. So purpose, deepening relationships, innovate. Um, awesome, fantastic um, advice coming from you. Well, easier said than done, though. Easy for me to say. <laughs> but it's great. And there's, there are so many questions. I think this is one of the most questions that we've had at um, our events, um, which, is, which is wonderful. Some of them we've asked. Um, with the polarised situation in the US, um, I guess this comes into the question within the conversation we had earlier, I suppose, um, especially with the most recent events. What do you think are the risks of um, brands taking positions that would alienate customers? So you kind of answered it a little bit, but could you be a little bit more specific? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I mean, it's, it's such a tough one. I mean, and it's, uh, look, I mean, I think my own, my own personal view on that whole topic is I think brands and individuals should be examining themselves most of all, you know, reflecting on our own behavior, our own assumptions, our own biases, our own practices. And that's the most valuable thing we can do is to reflect and then change our own actions as businesses and individuals. Um, but that said, I do think taking a position and, and, you know, and adding to the voice of it that in a way that shows support is something that's very important. And I've seen a lot of brands do that, take very quite bold positions and strong positions. And I think that's admirable. Um, yeah. I mean, in that particular, that particular, you know, issue, I mean, is, you know, I think was it, was it Bezos yesterday I said, I don't want clients or I don't, I don't care about the customers. They don't agree with me. I and mean, I think there's kind of in his camp on that one, but you know. Lovely. <laughs> Not that's my opinion on that one. Um, uh, I'm being given a, a, a few minute time check so we can move on to the, um, the, uh, the, the connecting part of the uh, seminar. So I'm really interested to know um, with all of your advice, um, what, what, what's your, what would you like your COVID legacy? Be. purpose is practical in a nutshell love yeah. that and that's you individually as well as the brands that you well that's me to me that's with. me in my in my practice my work i mean that's a work I me mean, a personal life thing i mean it's i mean i mean i think we probably have all had interesting experiences in terms of like my kids as i mentioned we're on holiday we we're on holiday together visiting my mother and we ended up for one week we ended up staying there for three months Wow, and, how was that? Um, and it was overall, I mean, you know, it was overall a very, you know, great, but, but they never would have had that time with her, you know, or together, you know, and uh, so it was a really interesting experience for all of us to sort of be taken out of time and space and put into this other environment and us all, you know, it's just, and so in some ways, I think we'll look back on it as being very sweet, you know, and very, it was very charming and chance to be with her and together and, you know. So I'm sure we all have those stories of where there's been some sort of unintended benefits and kind of magic that's happened in this time. But oh, hugely. And I think particularly in communities and getting to know the people around you that right. usually would walk by. I think there's a huge, a huge amount there and a lot for us as marketers to learn from that. So looking to the future, what do you think um, the marketing department will look like in five years time? Community relations. I mean, it'll be, because it, again, it's about co-creation. I mean, it's so much of it, you know, is about, you know, marketing is also just the evolving nature of what a brand is. I mean, it used to be to make a product, brand the product, market the product, hope to attract an audience that is, that will buy the product. And then old, if you're really lucky, have some loyalty and community around it. I think that model is going to completely inverse. So, and I think a great example I often use is Glossier. If you know the, the brand Glossier that started as a blog into the gloss, you know, we're no into the, yeah, into the gloss and then, um, so it starts as an assertion of belief, then you attract community, then that community helps you make products, then you sell them, right? So that they complete the flow, the work, the, the workflow is completely different. And I think that's where brand is going to shift. It's going to shift in that way where you're more about cultivating and attracting community of interest that is getting messaging and, and you know, comms out, which is part of it, but that's not going to be the dominant part of it. Yeah, I love that. So what would you, if you could leave our, I mean, you've given us so much advice and takeouts and then and hopefully people will stay on to, to ask some questions as well. But, but if you could give us one big takeaway piece of advice to our audience as you're, as you're leaving um, uh, insight, what would it, what would it be, Thomas? I mean, it sounds very self-serving and it's, you know, I, and I know I work for a brand consultancy and all that, but I think brand has never been more important than ever. I mean, I think that is, and yet it's always evolving and always changing. And so that's the, that's the sort of interesting paradox of our craft, right? Is that we know the value of it. We know it's there, but 
how we use it um, and how it creates value is always evolving. So the trick is to remain true to the true to who we are, true to purpose, true to brand, but always adapting and responsive to the dynamics of the marketplace and society and technology. And that's some people that's a kind of confusing and ambiguous world to live in. I love that. I like the ambiguities, you know, which I think a lot of people in our work do like that. Yeah. And sort of half rational, half emotional, these these grays, you know, but I think that's the that's the trick is remain true to who you are and yet responsive to the present moment. And that's that's ultimately the kind of Zen mastery of brand. I love that. That could almost be a quote. True to who you are and responsive to the present moment. That's very nice. So on that note, I'm going to wrap up this part of the webinar. Thank you so much. I think you gave us in a very short period of time some incredible insight. And as always, we will collect um, and collate all of the um, the tips and frameworks and different things that you gave us um, and share to our members. Um, but in terms of the key learnings that um, I think we can take away, do what you do best, cultivate your community, be prepared to change and practice the possible. So thank you. Thank you so much. So if you've enjoyed today, we would love um, you to give, as always, the, um, the your feedback on uh, the poll that will be coming up on your screen right now. Um, and then what we're going to do, uh, for those of you that want to stay on, we're going to make you co-hosts. So we'd love as many of you to stay on as possible. Um, we haven't tried this before, but people have asked us to, um, to, to, to try it. And as a society, we're always about experimenting and trying things new, as you know, and bringing our community together to connect and get to know each other. So, um, thank you very much for filling out the webinar. Um, whilst we are moving on to um, getting everyone into a co-host space, um, which the girls are doing now behind the scenes, um, I just wanted to let you know that in the spirit of um, collaboration and the power of collaboration and building communities, um, we've got a fantastic event coming up tomorrow um, with um, none other than Lord Seb Co. So I have the brilliant um, honour to uh, have a conversation with him and some other fantastic people, including Ellie Norman, um, Marketing Communications Director of Formula One, Guy Kinnings, Deputy CEO and Chief Commercial Officer for the European Tour, and also Issam Kasim, the CEO of Dubai Tourism Group. So it's coming from our Dubai um, head office, and um, we're really, really looking forward to that. And it's very much built on some of the great insight that Thomas has, has talked today, particularly around power of collaboration and building communities and working together as we as we move outside of COVID times. So thank you um, very much. Um, we are going to start making people into co-hosts. Um, as we speak, I can see some people are staying on, which is great. Um, and what we're going to start to do as we bring people into the co-host space is we're going to start to um, ask, some, ask some questions as, as you come up. Um, so, Kylie, are you, are you bringing people up into the co-host? Yeah, if you untick that up. video box, Gemma, you'll be able to see everybody on the screen. Amazing. I couldn't... Didn't, Right. I need help, everyone. Um, those of you that know me when it comes to technology, I am not the best. So uh, the team needs to help me with that. So let me just untick the box. Um, the, the same for yourself, Tom, if you just untick the video settings box. Oh, cool. We've got lots, lots of people. Hi. This is exciting. I'm so used to just talking to one screen and talking at myself. So it's really amazing to see people. Oh, so you, are you going to come on and show your faces as well? Lots of lovely pictures. That's amazing. Thomas, I think you're pretty popular. It's, uh, it, it's shocking. It's cool. How's hey. everyone doing? It's really good to see you all. Hi, George. You're on mute. Lots of you are on mute. Hi, Jay. Lovely to see you. Loving your articles that you're writing after this, um, the session. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi, Gail. How are you doing? Hi, Richard. This is brilliant. I haven't seen all of you for so long. This is wonderful. Hi there, Robert. Hello. Who else have we got? So how are you all? Good. Yeah? Looks like a nice day in the UK. The sun's out. <laughs> it was. Oh, I'm in Los Angeles. It's six in the morning here. So, so oh, that explains uh, it. LA, you know. 
the Griffith Observatory is right right over there. So it's very overcast in London. Really uh, overcast today. I was being distracted by LA. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the LA one was a fake background. I didn't realize it was real. I'm very jealous. <laughs> So, have we got everyone that's joining us? And is everyone going to put their screens on and show us themselves? Much nicer to see a face. Yeah, this is everyone now. This is everyone. Lovely. So, I've got some people on my screen. Um, so, I'm assuming there's two screens. Ah, Jules. Friendly face. Hello. You, how are you Hi. doing? I'm muted. I'm good, thank you. Good, good to see you. There's two Julies right next to each other. I don't know if you know that, and you can see that on your screen. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant. Can everyone see everyone? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. This is very cool. So, anyone got cool any... <laughs> huh? Talk about then. <laughs> we have done the weather. <laughs> we have done the weather. <laughs> what do we usually do at our events, Richard? You join lots of them. Uh, we wander about, get a drink, have a nice chat about marketing mostly. We do. And catch up on, on just the world and generally. So, um, so you, anyone else that we didn't ask, because there were a lot of questions coming in, got any questions for Thomas? Um, well, I know I Richard, you had a question. Give us, give, us a, give us a good book that we can read about community building. That's a good that's a good question. I don't know, is there a good book? I mean, I wrote a chapter for a book on purpose that focused on community uh, perspectives on purpose. Um, yeah, a book on community. I don't know that I. That's a great. I don't think I have a ready answer to that. I mean, there's. I think it would be outside of the marketing world, I and mean, I think it's about looking. I mean, I think I, I find the most inspiration outside of the the category, and I think. Mm -hmm. You know, people that are able to cultivate. And I'll tell you, I mean, it can be, you know, uh, myth. It can be history. I mean, I think there's so many lessons around people that are able to do that. And how do they do it? I think those are the, I often go outside and pull those into the marketing world as opposed to reading specific marketing books. That's a great idea. I speak to my kids about that. Get some inspiration from them as well. I love the myth. I mean, it's sort of weird, but I love, you ever heard the myth of stone soup? About the guy yeah. that the village with the stone and then ends up they're all very angry at each other and then he ends up making this soup with a with a stone and they all contribute to it in the end they're all happy that's that's community right there in a nutshell that, that myth is that's 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 a community-led thing i mean that nice i like that anyone else got any good examples of books that they would recommend about well, community building I've actually started reading one. Hang on. Here you go. That's my, that's my tip to everyone at the Marketing Society today. I can't see it because it's reflecting. I'm going to read it. Okay, so it's The Membership Economy by uh, Robbie Kelman Baxter. I got tipped off to give that a read, and I'm about 50 pages in. And it's absolutely amazing. I mean, you know, it's kind of looking at the Netflix economy and then how you build communities and exactly what you were talking about, uh, about the assertion at the beginning and then inviting members in. And then once you've done that, then you, you know, you're almost sort of selling products in reverse. It's, yeah. it's great. I'll check it out. That's great. Yeah. Brilliant. Any other questions for Thomas? Julie Dolman, I can see you there, lovely lady. Um, she's like, why are you picking on me? Hello. <laughs> any, any questions? You must have a question for, for Thomas. I've got a... Anyone else? I have a question. Yeah. Can I Brilliant. jump in? Nick, absolutely. Nick, yeah. Hi, Nick. Hi, uh, Nick. Um, my question was, my question was, <laughs> we've, we've heard what the amazing pivots have been, the brands that have done fantastically those that have uh, you know performed amazingly under pressure who's really screwed up who's what are the biggest mistakes that have been made because I, there has been a lot of focus on the success but i think we can learn from mistakes as well obviously right so what are the what are the big what are the big lessons to be learned as far as what not to do 
Well, I mean, there's lots of personal. I mean, this is the last 24 hours. Bon Appetit's editor, uh, the cross is it the CrossFit guy? You know, you know. I mean, two you know two people have gotten fired. I don't, I don't know if the CrossFit guy's gotten fired yet, but he probably will be for making comments and or behavior that was you know inappropriate to the times. Mm. Um, you know, I think that you know, you know. I mean. I, is there a, I mean, there's a few, I mean, I think there's the, the worst mistake I've seen, I think generally is people just sort of being platitudinal and not really doing anything other than just sort of flag waving and, you know, motherhood apple pie stuff. I think the evidence is going to be post COVID. I think there's going to be a real die off of brands. Um, and I think we're going to see some people that just don't come out of this succeeding. And, um, you know, I think that's going to be the real evidence of it. I mean, in terms of business practices, um, you know, and there's nothing that comes to mind immediately other than people making sort of inopportune comments or, you know, being politically tenured. Yeah. But I think that the lack of, the lack of responsiveness will in itself be um, evidence as they just don't come out of this with any success. And, and do you think it's the, the bury the head in the sand is also one of the, the big problems that is existing that people are thinking i'm not sure what to do i'm frozen i'll uh, i'll just not do anything and then they suffer as a result right yeah that and or they're they're you know that or as we've all experienced there's leaders there's lots of discord among the leaders and so they're all operating in different ways and so it just creates noise and confusion um which yeah. we're seeing. and again i'm seeing that and that ties back to the purpose idea that they're just they're, they don't know what to do and therefore everyone's just acting in a kind of erratic you know way yeah, no center of gravity. Love that. Cool. Julie, you were going to ask a question. You must have one. Julie Dolman, I'm looking at you. I thought Nick saved me from having to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, I, I suppose I, I don't have a question. I really liked your presentation. Um, so thanks for that. I, I guess um, the thing that I, I just would make a comment, which is, um, I just, I, I'm loving seeing brands brave enough to just take a stand and, and use their voice for good. Um, and knowing that it's not going to make everybody happy. Um, and that, uh, you know, you might, you might make a mistake, but, um, you know, you're at least putting yourself out there. And I, I sit on the board of a, a really cool business in the U S and, um, you know, our, our founder put a really amazing message out there. Um, and, you know, most people loved it. And some people thought it was just a, a white woman, you know, who was just trying to, um, you know, use, use, um, some, some devastation in the world as a platform. And, you know, so it's just, I mean, and she was sort of devastated. It was like, what should I do? I'm like, nothing. You put yourself out there and you're, you're really authentic. And, you know, you, you took a stand and you're willing to make change in your own business. That's already a very purpose led business and you can't make everybody happy. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess I just sort of salute, um, bravery because I'm feeling really strongly about the fact that, you know, being silent, um, during this time is part of the problem and we yeah. just need to kind of put ourselves out there. Yeah. And I think to your point, I mean, I just think the days of playing it safe are over. I mean, as a brand, yeah. I mean, Totally. That's not just about politics or social issues. It's also about, you know, what's your price point? You know, what, you know, what's, what, what's the value of your product? You know, like, how do you, you know, how do you differentiate? I mean, all of these things, um, you know, you know, brands are, to be a brand is to assert something and it's a stand for something. And that's, that's at a social level. It's at a, you know, in a personal level. It's at a product level, the value of your product, the, the social impact of your product. I mean, all of those things are dimensions of a brand and you just can't, you can't play it safe. You know, you can't, which I think for a long time, you know, growing up, certainly when I was a kid, I mean, brands really tried to play it safe, right? And I just think those days are gone and they're really gone now when it comes to social issues. You cannot stand by in silence. That's right. I think you could also hide back in those days too, right? A brand could hide and there wasn't all of these platforms to, um, to, to be called out so right. you just can't hide anymore yeah totally so true so true jay what about you do you have a question okay we're in new york you're on mute just so you know 
I, I really love what Thomas said and uh, absolutely understand about purpose and practical. I have worked with numbers of uh, ad salespeople, uh, mainly television and web based, you know, app based, who said they are not, uh, they found a lot of brands are pulling back the advertising. So I wonder if you've seen that. Yeah, I mean, I think there is there is part of that. I mean, I think there's, mm -hmm. you know, certainly that that is happening. Um, I don't have a direct, pure, mm -hmm. good read on the, I, I feel like I hear different information on it. I hear that it's not as bad as people thought it would be. I hear it's coming back. I mean, we'll see. Um, probably does, how much of that is, is, a, is a media and advertising issue versus a financial issue that they're facing themselves as a business. So I don't have a lot of insights into that. Um, certainly that's, WPP is very attuned to that dynamic, but um, it's hard to know how much of that's just recession, you know, in business environment versus a shift in behavior. Does anyone else think, anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, Daniel, how you doing? Put your mute off yet? <laughs> Hello, I'm very well, I'm from Glasgow. I heard another Hi. story earlier. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a product design engineer and uh, I was really interested to, to kind of see more of a, a marketing perspective on all this, whereas I come from more of a product development side of things. So I was more interested in the, the how brands can be collaborative between each other. And I was really interested in Thomas to see your, your kind of viewpoint on that. I'd be really interested to see, you know, the, the future of particularly startup um, kind of brands, uh, particularly within like the products and marketing, um, but how they all kind of be affected um, in the future with, you know, everything that's going on uh, because I know there's been a massive push in terms of, you know, everything being political. There's been a big push on sustainability. Then as what's just been said, there's, there's a massive, massive, you know, restraint on startups with the whole financial, uh, yeah. those kind of things. So I wonder what, I wonder what your perspective is or anyone else who's, who's interested in that, but what's, what's your perspective on particularly like startup companies? I mean, I know the VC funding is definitely an issue, and I've heard that in the Bay Area. I have friends out there. I mean, you do hear that is that is an issue, um, but I don't think that's an enduring issue. I think there's always. I mean, look, the innovation pipeline is startups. I mean, that is for most businesses. They innovation happens to startups, and they get acquired into the more established businesses, and that is the kind of innovation model of our economy, right? You know, for large and large part. So I don't think that's going to change. Um, you know, I you know I think. By definition, most startups are much closer to a sense of community because, again, it goes back to another word I love in branding is assertion. And that can be, the assertion doesn't be like a hugely noble or, you know, esoteric. It can be, I'm going to make the best donut in the world. You know, I'm going to make a really good pair of, you know, blue jeans. You know, it's an assertion of quality. I mean, I love the notion of quality as a kind of value, as a, I think that's something that's happened in society over the last 10 years. We've kind of reacquainted ourselves with quality as almost a, you know, there's a kind of inherent truth in it. You know, what's the quality of the experience? What's the quality of the goods, the quality of the design, the quality of the industrial design, the form factor, all those things. The quality is in itself an intrinsic value. And I think a lot of startups are very attuned to that versus, you know, if I'm being honest, established corporate, you know, brands are often quality is a negotiable kind of, uh, you know, subjective decision based on price points. And, you know, so I think it's, there, there's a different mentality in a startup world around value creation, which I think the world needs. And so I don't think that's going away, notwithstanding VC funding. Nice. Okay, thank you. Lovely. Any other questions before oh, we wrap up? I think we've got one over here. I can't pronounce your name, my love. So can you, can you tell me? <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Hi. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Ntavya Singh. There we go. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Brilliant name. Um, so considering the um, global devastations that um, COVID-19 has brought on, do you think that we'll start seeing um, a bit more responsibility from brands and people as a whole moving forward? Um, con especially considering that this might be something that happens in the future again. Yeah, I do. I mean, I think it's. I think that trend was already happening. I think this is just like put the put the gas on. I mean, now it's like just, you know, we've gone from going ten miles an hour to hundred miles an hour. I think it's just going to accelerate the belief in corporate responsibility and the role that businesses play in society at large across many different fronts. And that's social, economic. It's it's um, environmental. I mean, there's all the different dimensions of that. 
you know, diversity and inclusion is all, all of that I think is now even more an integral part of how businesses operate and how they create value. And I just think that's just been, you know, the, the events of the last few months have just, I think just accelerated that innovation curve. It was already happening, but I think it's just make, making it go faster. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. I love that. Any more questions before we, we wrap up um, this bit? I think um, Thomas, you've got a hard stop at three. I understand. Yeah. Um, using American term there, me. Um, anyone, um, any other questions, George? I knew you'd have a question. Hi, yeah, George, uh, lovely to see you. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. Uh, Hi, Gemma. Hi, everyone. Uh, quick question is uh, that data are driving uh, right now companies in form their commercial strategy. In that respect, brand building is completely challenged because of the data and the abundance of websites site traffic data or vanity metrics. What is your viewpoint on this? I don't know if I got the entire question, saying that the role of data in brand building in terms of... Yes, I mean, right now, brand building is being challenged by data strategy or by gathering this data through website traffic. And they say, actually, our brand awareness is uh, so-and-so according to Google, which is not reliable enough, you know. But nevertheless, there, there is a, a game changing uh, arena around the fact uh, that start, the companies want to inform their strategy through uh, data and not through proper brand strategy planning or what, whatever happens. You know, what, what's your viewpoint on this? You know, look, I think data is very useful for brand building. And I'm looking at Nick Cooper, who's on the line here from Landor, who's runs our insights analytics practice, where we do what quantify, you know, econometric and analytics. I mean, but look, this is the strange beast that brands are. Brands are very rational. They're very strategic. You're addressing an you know, segmentation. You're, you know, you're measuring. You've got KPIs. You have all those things. But in the end, a brand is always, a great brand is always composed of a little bit of magic. And the ineffable and that is you know i think that's will always be with us you know no matter how much data and analytics and big data and all that stuff and ai and all those things that sound scary and all these things but people because humans brands are built for humans i mean that's sort of like and that sounds sort of banal but it's it is it's built for humans and humans are emotional and they're moody and they don't know what they want and so I think it's about bridging those. I mean, branding at its best and strategy at its best, and I, something I really push at Landor is, it is that really to bridge the quantifiable with the ineffable. You know, and we have to be able to walk in both of those. And I don't think that's going to change. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Any more questions before we wrap? Maybe one last question. Robert, go for it. I think what's interesting to me about brands in a, in a situation like we're in now is that often when we have um, governments and regimes that are either non-responsive or reactionary, very often we have sort of brands stepping in um, on a certain side and either legitimizing or advancing uh, a certain point of view. I mean, I, the one that comes to mind in this context is sort of what Nike did with Colin Kaepernick and, but we, there, there are many other examples. So just sort of, you know, that, 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 that idea of, um, of, you know, how do, how do brands, you know, I worked at Levi's for a long time, right? So if you're, if you're a brand like Nike or Levi's, you've done a lot of work for an awful long time to be able to step up but sort of how do you sort of see the role of of, of brands going of, of brands going forward especially when we're in very contentious times and very polarized societies you know when just a couple of comments on that would be would be interesting yeah, yeah. i mean look i think i mean i think that brands are more and more going to take strong positions i mean and you're, you're seeing it I mean, I do a lot of work with B2B businesses, large B2B um, uh, corporate brands, which historically have been really, really risk averse. And, you know, and they're not anymore. They're really changing. They're taking some very strong positions on issues, sustainability issues, inclusion and diversity issues, um, LGBTQ issues. I mean, it's like there are, 
and they don't really have to often. I mean, they often they're doing it, even if it's outside of their business, it's not really part of their core, you know, market. And, you know, and there's a couple of reasons why. One is, I think they, there's, a, there's a moral truth in it. They want to be recognized as good businesses. Two, the investor communities now expect more and more of that kind of um, behavior. So people are often investing in businesses based on their, um, you know, their social positions and their moral positions and their value creation. Attracting employees, attracting high quality talent requires being a place people want to work and where you have shared values and you stand for similar things. So, you know, what's I think what we've all seen, I'm sure we all know this, is that, you know, it used to be like cor you know, corporate philanthropy or, you know, we give money to the symphony, whatever it was. Now, more and more, sustainability, social issues are integral to business strategy. And I, I just don't, I think that's just going to keep going, you know, for the reasons I listed. I mean, I think because... A, they want to be good companies, but also because to attract the right kind of talent, investors, partners, people, they have to have a clear sense of, of a moral purpose. Thank you. And I think on that note, um, that's a that's a perfect um, word to end on purpose. I think that's the that's the word of the day, isn't it, Thomas? So thank you so much. Um...